Hello. So the reason for this talk, one of the reasons that I'm doing on the whiteboard is that I could not prepare the slides. Right? So it was too complicated for me to go through everything I wanted to say. But I think that I went through phases in my developer career. Since the beginning, I was very in into software design, since I started. Uh, that goes back 22 years ago. About 12 years ago, uh, almost 14 years ago actually, when I moved to the UK, someone, that was when I got in touch with the whole Agile thing. I heard about this thing about uh, extreme programming. I thought it was very cool, but it was too weird. And, and then someone said like, you like so much software design, why don't you try this thing called TDD? And I said, because I don't need that. Why would I do that? It sounds very stupid to me. And then someone said, no, you know what, but try it. Wholeheartedly, really, really try it for a month. It was painful, extremely painful, because I felt that everything that I was doing was slow. So I said, like, I can visualize the design already. I can visualize the solution. So why don't I just go for it? And if people really care too much about it, I write a test afterwards. And then someone said, no, do it. And I've done it. And I've done it for a, a few months, close to three months, and I never looked back. So I want to make it clear in this talk that although I'm talking about the design aspects of TDD or how to evolve an application, how to evolve the design on an application through TDD, this is not a talk against TDD. I just to make it very, very clear. What happened was, uh, for me, I said many times, if you go back to some of the talks that I have or things that I, read, uh, I wrote, you will see me over the past 12 years saying, TDD leads to good design. TDD leads to good design. And I've been repeating that over and over and over again. About two or three years ago, I read a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Fast and Slow. This book was a slap in my face. It made me realize that I do a lot of things without questioning, that I was not special, that I was not smarter than anyone else. But it really made me th rethink about everything I took for granted, including my professions, like, I do TDD, why do I do that? Why do I think that it leads to good design? And then I, and I start paying attention of my design decisions while I'm test driving code. Where do they come from? Which DD style do I use? And then I also was uh, paying attention at other people, other developers. Where do the, the design decisions come from when they are test driving their code? There are different styles of TDD. How do they impact the design? So, and, and then there's a lot of people that I respect that use different approaches and they get stuff done. But I was interested to know where the design comes from. So why, another thing that, that uh, puzzled me is TDD is a very simple thing, right? So normally the flow would be you write a, write a failing test, you make it pass, you make it better, right? In a nutshell, this is the TDD uh, cycle. So, we quite often say that this is a design tool. I'm changing my mind a bit. I prefer to think about as a software, design, a software development workflow. It's a way of working. Design needs to emerge somehow. But this, I love this rhythm. One of the things that I like the most in TDD is this rhythm, working very small increment, always in safe steps. Right? I always know where I am. But I treat that more as a workflow than a design. And I'll try to explain um, why. So normally, in the, the traditional uh, TDD approach, so there are two, just to give some context, there are, yeah, that's not, I haven't tried that. I tried all the pens and stuff. I just didn't try to, to erase anything. So there are normally two, is it? Big enough at the back? 
classicists. So one of the styles, there are, there are different TDD styles. This is important to understand because one of the reasons that people don't, they, everyone understands this, but one of the reasons that they don't use that in a nice way to emerge, to, to create good designs, is because they, they, they don't understand where the design should come from. And also, like, there are different types of things that we are building. We might be building an algorithm, we might be building a, a business feature, we might be building integration with other systems. The, the type of feature that we are building impacts, oh, well, choosing a, uh, one of the CDG styles, if, it's, if that CDG style is not suitable to what you are building, you have problems. And I think that a lot of people don't understand that there are different styles of TDD. So one of them is called Classicist. That is the original one created by Kent Beck. That was back in the late 90s, if I'm not wrong. So, and the other one is called Outside In. Outside In. So they are significantly different in the styles. They both follow this uh, loop in here, but in the classicist approach, normally what we do, we write a failing test, and you go as fast as possible from red to green. You do the simplest thing could possibly work, just make it work. Duplicate, hard code, do whatever, but just make it work. Once it works, then you go to the refactoring phase and say, let's see the mess that I created. If I create a mess that I can identify, I say, okay, now it's time to clean up. So design, in, in, the, in the classicist approach happens here. This is what I call emergent design. When you are building the system, when you are trying to make it work, you don't care about anything, you just care about making it work. Once it works, you evolve your design. How do you do that? So TDD doesn't prescribe. I even asked uh, Ron Jeffries uh, a few years ago, it's like, what is the guideline here? Because this is the problem that I have. When you get to this stage, what we are saying is like, I forgot to start the timer. <laughs> and what, uh, what is the guideline here? So make it better is a bit too generic. One of the things that people take as uh, guidelines, they would talk about the, the four rules of simple design. So they will be like, uh, pass all the test, uh, reviews intention, no duplication, and uh, fewer elements. JB is probably somewhere in the audience. He has a slightly different version of it that summarizes, I think, that reduced that to two steps and stuff. It's very interesting. But I would, my, my main uh, point was, is this part of this? Or does, this is just a design guideline? Where does it come? Where, what about solid? What about DDD? What about coupling and cohesion? What about connaissance? What about all those other things? Design patterns. So for me, those design guidelines are not necessarily part of TDD. TDD gives you this workflow and say, hey, specify what you want, what you want the, the code to do, make sure that you make it work, and then you get better. But this is vague for me. In order for, for me, for people to do it, to, to be successful with TDD, they need to understand this. So, but people say, well, but uh, it's helping with your design. It, it, it certainly has an influence because you are forced to specify first uh, the, the boundaries and stuff. But the, when you think about, for example, there is a business, there is a behavior that I need to add to my code. When I write this test, I need to decide, decide which class or function will contain that code. What is the interface? What is the parameters? What is the return type? Which layer this class is in the bigger picture? Those are all design decisions that regardless which style of TDD you are using, you need to make up front. You already decided where the code is going to be. What we will help you in here is the internals of that code that you might further define. But the, the inception, the trigger, where the code that will trigger that behavior, you are designing what I call just-in-time. So the, the code that emerged from the refactoring, I call emergent design. 
But the design decisions that we make before 3D are called just-in-time design. So, but we very often, we don't think that classes, or defining the class, defining the method, the uh, parameters and return type, they are all design. So, let me uh, explore this a bit. So, there is the class assist 3D. Another name that some people give to do, uh, to, to, to class assist is the Chicago School. Some people call it Detroit School, Cleveland School, somewhere in the US School. Uh, outside in, quite often, is also uh, called London School or Mockist, which I don't like at all. I really don't like this uh, as a name. But there is a difference why those two things were created. Oh, those different styles. There is another one that I don't like to put it. It's called TDD as if you meant it. I think that is too crazy to talk about. Uh, so, the one thing that is important to understand is that those different TDD styles, they are not opposing each other. They're not like either or. Most people that are, the, the, the best TDD practitioners that I know, they normally mix and match the two. Right? So basically, the decision is according to what we are doing, we will pick one style. And it gets so automatic in our heads that we don't even think about that anymore. We just, oh, this is what I want to build. I'm going to test drive this way. This, that what it's gonna, this is what I want to build. I'm going to test drive in a different way. So that is the, the difference. But like, let me try to explain to you. Let me focus first on the classicist approach. Let's talk about how design emerge in this kind of um, TDD. Normally what you do, here are your tests, you write your first test. According to this test, you need to put that behavior somewhere. So the class emerges. So this test is forcing you to think about where do I want to put the behavior that I'm test driving. So this is the first design decision where the behavior goes. The second design decision is how do I trigger this behavior? That's when the public method emerges. So what should I pass, if anything, to, to this method? That's when the parameters emerge. Do I expect something back? That's when there is return type. In class assist, in general, well, but it's what we call a state-based test. What do I mean by that? Normally, you will have an input. So you, you instantiate, you put your system in a certain state. You invoke your system with some data, and you check the next state. So, so you are always checking state. So normally, the, the, the test here is an assert that something is equal to something else or different from some, something else. So this is what I call a state base. The thing, so how does design evolve? We write a very simple test. We make the simplest thing could possibly work. And then, probably in the first test, there's not much to refactor. You probably hard-coded or did something like that. And then what happens is we start adding tests. And as we add more tests, these things become more complicated. And it evolves. So every test that I add here, more behavior will come to here. At some point, this public method will be a bit complicated. There will be a lot of things going on. In one of the refactoring phases, what we're going to do, we're going to extract a method, like private. Uh, if you're talking about functions, you might extract another function. And then you keep adding tests. And then you are, adding, you are extracting these private methods. And they are meant to just explain what the public method is doing. So the public method uh, instructions become more high level in terms of abstraction, and the details go to the private. But at, at some point, as the system grows, quite often we start having a need to test these private methods. We start adding so much behavior in here that it's becoming a bit complicated. Well, the, the class is becoming messy. And then what we end up doing in one of the refactoring stages is say, you know what? Let's extract these private methods to another class. And that's when your design starts evolving. The difference, the, the, the impact that this has is that this is started as a unit. So there is a, there's, we always discuss what is the size of a unit? What is the unit under test? 
In classes, this, this is more vague. So, well, I would say that the other one is also. But like, it starts with a class or a function, and as we extract, what happens is that the unit under test becomes bigger, and that's fine. So, in systems, in the class assist approach, very rarely we use mocks, right? So we just test the whole thing as a unit, and we keep evolving like that. Um, one of the beauties of this style of TDD is that there's no upfront design. So we just use emergent design. So there, there's a bare minimum of upfront, upfront design that is the definition of this class. I'll talk about class and methods because it's easier. Uh, and, and the definition of the method. But everything else emerges from the code you have. And this is a good thing because this constraints over engineering. You only design just enough for what we need and the design emerges from your code. So it's much easier to do this style, because this style doesn't know about the internals. It knows inputs and outputs. So writing tests like that is much easier. Evolving these is a little bit easier. Um, the what, how, when do I use this style? When I want to explore. So when I want to explore, for example, I have a small algorithm. I know that given this input, I expect this output. Either an algorithm enriching data, whatever it is, calculates a discount or whatever that is, right? So there will be some data coming in, some processing, enrichment, whatever that is, and there will be some data coming out. Different inputs, different outputs. When I, know, when I have this kind of situation, I like to use this style. And also when, for example, sometimes you have there is an input and there is an output, but it's a very complex logic or flow to come up with this transformation from input to output. But there's no domain concepts, there's no nouns and verbs. I cannot really have anchors in terms of domain. So when I can, and, and things like that, you cannot visualize a solution. So this style, working very small increments and let that code emerge, is when I use this. I, I prefer this style. So. Things get very complicated if you try to apply this style to business features or to systems that have a more complex domain. Let's assume that this is feature one, right? So we started like that. And then you have feature two. And let's assume that this is your domain, yeah? So feature two comes along, and then you're going to write some tests. And then for this feature here, you're going to start from your module D. And you start adding behavior, start adding tests, adding tests. So this gets a bit complicated. A few private methods are created. At some point, you decide to move one of them to class E. And then you say, as those classes are, as soon as in your domain, a class is extracted, now this class here, the, the life cycle of this class, is detached from where it came from. As you evolve your domain, those things now are concepts, are domain concepts. And you might want to reuse some of them. And you might be, you might be, not that you will, depending on the complexity of your domain and, uh, and how features interrelate. But you might be in a situation where now feature one and feature two, they share let's say this product validation, this whatever, whatever this is, right? So there might be, because this now is a domain concept and is used in different features, so this has a strong role in your domain. Let's say there is some sort of a discount calculator. For example, if you're in an in a insurance company, calculating the policy, the premium, and the discount is quite complex. There's a tons of data that you need to analyze in order to calculate those things. And you might need to even access different systems. So you might have a feature. As your domain gets bigger, those domain concepts, they end up growing. And there might be a feature that will make this class evolve. And one of these evolutions might be to go to a database or to use class uh, F. 
that will go to an external system somewhere. And all of a sudden, because everything is using the real class and you're not using mocks anywhere, as soon as I evolve this class, feature one is broken, feature two is broken, the tests are broken. And then the refactoring, so what started very simple, writing very simple tests, as your domain evolves, those tests become more and more difficult to maintain because your units are growing and you might have an, uh, a dependency across features. And every now and again, you have tons of tests broken. Uh, that's why a lot of people complain, I don't like TDD because every time that I make some small change, many tests are broken. This is one of the reasons. So, you, would you have this problem with class assist? As I said, it depends on the features. So if you have feature one, that there will be a class in here, and then it will talk to a few classes in here, and then another class in here, and then it talks to the database. And feature two is a similar thing. There is an entry point, an API or something. There is some domain logic in here, some repository that goes to the database, maybe the same database. You very rarely you have problems with your tests because the features are very detached. This is very common in a CRUD application, right? Creating, updating a product, creating, updating a client, there's very little overlapping features. So very rarely an evolution of these will impact on this. But if you have a more complex, then, then it will be a nightmare to do this way. Another problem that you have when uh, your units under test, they become bigger, is that as soon as you make a mistake or you make a change and a test is failing, it's very difficult now to figure out where. So the diagnosis of problems when the unit is too big, the unit under test is too big, is to figure out where the problem is. This is another uh, problem that we have with this uh, style. So refactoring that started very small, we learned that refactoring is a good thing, but quite often, as the system evolves, refactoring becomes a big thing because detaching all those things or evolving, because if I want to start mocking those tests from this one, well, before, the behavior was expected here. So we start detaching, that is not just create an interface, I need to change all these tests as well, because now some of those tests are relying on the, 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 the code to go through all the classes as soon as I detach one. There is an impact in my test, then I need to move the test somewhere else as well. I need to inject things in constructors. So refactoring is not easy as you are evolving in this method. So the setup of those tests, if you, make, you keep making your unit bigger, become also more and more complex. As you add more classes to this, writing those tests become very difficult now because they need to take into account the whole execution. So, How, so how do we know? So this is class assist. I think that it's great for things that I don't have a domain thing. So inputs and outputs where I cannot see the internals or the internals are not about domain concepts, class assist for me is awesome. But how do we define the size of our unit? I think this is a better discussion to have. So how do I know? the right size of a unit to be the unit under test. One way to think about this is, let's say that we have class A that somehow talks to class B and talks to class C. How you got there, either you create this this way or you, it, class B and C emerged from refactoring is less relevant for this, for what I'm trying to say here. So what we need to understand is, like when I have my tests, would I make the unit under test all three classes? Would I make just A and B and mock C? Or would I mock B and C? Because those are the options that I have. How do I decide that? First of all, is to understand this is, a, this is an association, right? Association. So A is associated to B and C. But now we need to understand what kind of association we have. So there are two types of associations, right? One is called composition, composition, and the other one is called aggregation.
This is a very important thing to distinguish. So, in composition, B and C are part of A. They're, association means A uses B and C. The, the specialization here is like, it uses, but are B and C part of A? Or they are independent things that are just used by A? So, when it is a composition, The notation, it's quite safe to make this a unit and test everything together and not mock those things. How do you know if this is a composition or aggregation? One mental exercise that you can do is if you inline the behavior of B and C into A, A will become more complex for sure, but would it become less cohesive, or would it still remain cohesive? A an example would be if you have a discount calculator, and during the discount has loads of different steps. I might take into account the personal details. If, if the person is married, is the age and family and stuff, I might take there might be a different part of the algorithm that will be the credit score, or how often they claimed uh, something on the insurance. So there are different steps. But if I inline them all, they are still a discount calculator. A will still be cohesive. It will just be messy. So this is a composition. So a different way of thinking is when it's an aggregation. Aggregation is the opposite. If I inline B and C into A, A will not be cohesive. Or a very a simpler way of saying that, a will violate single responsibility principle. If I have a checkout process, and as part of my checkout, as soon as I go to the website and say, oh, that's my uh, uh, payment details, pay. As part of the payment flow or the checkout flow, I need to verify which payment method was chosen and then redirect to the right gateway, but I also need to create orders. I also need to notify the user. I also need to trigger the delivery. Those things. If I inline those things into A, A will certainly violate single responsibility principles. So then you know that your units under test should just be A, and those things should be mocked. So this is an exercise that is, is very important uh, for us to do uh, when, when we are test-driving code. So this leads me to the question, back to the original question of the talk is, is this knowledge coming from TDD? Or is this knowledge coming from design knowledge that I already had previously? Right, so if I was not test driving this code, would I make the same design decisions? So, and if yes, or similar design decisions, then TDD, is a great workflow that I absolutely love to work, but the design decisions, the trigger for, the trigger means the, 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 the 3D flow is triggering. So like, okay, it's, wor it's working now, now is your time to design. That's, what, that's why I say there is a workflow. Specify, make it work, now design. Now let's fix it, do it properly. But what I do in this phase, I need to build on top of a, a, a software design foundation before. So, so to, in order to know what to do. So, how many people like mocks? Don't know if I raise my hand, I don't know what he's gonna say next, right? So, <laughs> so, 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 every time I give this talk, like I, I talk about completely random things and, and I never cover everything I want. So, I want to demystify mocks before I talk about the other uh, example. So, how can I tackle that? Let's say that I have a feature that is this checkout thing that I talked about. Let's say that we have a web app, and so there is a checkout scenario. And in this checkout scenario, so I want to buy my item, so I press the submit button and stuff. I don't want to go through the whole user story now. What is important here is that there is a checkout, we say pay. As part of my acceptance criteria, I need to 
do the actual payment. The payment is a complex thing. I might need to identify which payment method was chosen, which country I am, if I need to choose a different gateways, if it's PayPal, if it's credit card. So there's a lot of things. It's not just call payment, right? So there's a lot of things related to payment in here. So there's also like we need to create an order. Order management is also quite complicated. Sometimes you need to create an order with a certain state and then wait for the, the result of the payment and then update it. And then so there's a whole order life cycle into this, right? So there's the delivery part and there is the notification part. Notification. So delivery is like, depending on where you are in the world, we need to know which delivery options are available to you. Some of them you can collect in the local store, some of them will be delivered to your house, some, of the, some place you have next day delivery, some place you need to wait. So delivery is also a complicated thing. Some, some items can be delivered, if you bought in the morning, can be delivered in the evening. Others will need to wait for two weeks. So, so there's a lot of things going on in here. And notifications just let the, the user know what uh, happened after they click checkout. So I want to talk about mocking as a design tool. Because like one of these debates that we have about, I, I think that the, the debates that we are having about mocks are the wrong ones. Because we are talking about mocks as a testing tool and not as a design tool. And if we understand that mocking can be used as a design tool, a lot of these, complex, these discussions, or many of those discussions, they go away. So let's say that we have this kind of scenario here. Let me just uh, erase this. I don't need this anymore. So we will have a browser, right? So someone is going to the browser and we say, make a payment. So there will be uh, some front end app in here, or some delivery mechanism. It can be mobile, it can be web, it can be whatever. And, and then there will be, so I want to test drive this flow. So I know that this thing in here will submit, right? So you send the payment, send payment details. or they want to process the payments, right? So that's the trigger. The first design decision that I need to make here, who is going to handle that? So in that, just for the sake of this example, to keep things simple, let's assume that I'm going to say, I'll have a payment API. So this will receive the HTTP request. Let's say that it's the web. Then the, what I need to decide now, how do I test drive this? Do I, put, do I build the entire system inside one single test? Or how do I evolve now this flow? One, one thing that I need to ask myself, if this is the class that is handling the output request, what is, what is, uh, what is the responsibility of its of its class. You can say, well, it's to process the payment. So then it's to do the whole system. Say, so, OK, what does it involve in, in processing the payment? What are the different steps, the different things that we need to do? Well, business-wise, that's kind of the flow that we want. But we also have a delivery mechanism. We need to handle this JSON that is coming in. We have to get these out of the request. We need to send the JSON back. So there is a lot of delivery mechanism logic should I mix that delivery mechanism logic with my domain knowledge, logic or not? So now we are not talking about testing anymore. We are purely talking about design. And that's what I was thinking. TDD is giving me, OK, you need to write the test now. But to write this test, I can have the option to write as a black box, as an acceptance test. I'm going to send some JSON in to this API, and I expect this JSON as a result. And I might expect something in the database somewhere or a message in a queue somewhere, and really treat as a black box. That's one option for sure, and we should do that anyway. But it's too big for testing all those stuff, all, all this stuff through from outside. So I might want to have smaller levels of testing, and that's the ones that I'm talking about now. So 
I will need to decide how much behavior I'm going to keep in here. One type of behavior that I need to have is to process to, to how do I call this? To parse, I'll just put random names, right? So, so we just get the idea. Uh, to parse the payload, right? So that's very generic because I'm dealing with JSON, HTTP request, and shit like that, right? So I also know that this class will need to respond something to my client. So there will be at some point, somewhere, some JSON that's going to come back, right? Uh, with the response and stuff. I will potentially will need to transform something in here, so generate response or something like that. Ge response. The problem is like what? I know that this class needs to do that. How much of this should I put in this class? How much should I delegate? So what we could do also, which layer does this class leave? Are this kind of behavior, knowing about HTTP, should they be in the same area of my code base or layer or whatever from these ones, or they should be separate? Because if I understand that this might be some sort of a delivery mechanism, right? So this is a delivery mechanism then I probably should not have a lot of business in here. But this design decision is coming from my head. TDD is saying, like, you need to design now, because you need to write this test. And this test needs to know what you have and where. So it's a trigger for me to design, but it doesn't tell me what to design. So then I can say, well, what if I, well, what am I doing here? I'm doing the checkout. So, what if I had a class in here that could call checkout? Checkout action. Right, so in domain-driven design, how many of you use, or are, is familiar with domain-driven design? Okay, how many of you are uh, familiar with clean architecture from Uncle Bob? Okay, a few hands. So in domain-driven design, this is an application service. In clean architecture, this is a use case. I just call it actions, because why not to give another name for the same thing, just to make it very confusing. So then I, I need to decide what's going to go there. So why, why don't I just say, make a payment? At this point, this design decision, what it allows me to do is understanding where that part of my behavior is here, part of my behavior is here. And this is when I look at the composition, back to the composition aggregation, Although I have only one client for now to the checkout action, because you, another way of some people say, well, if, there is only, if the payment API is the only class that uses checkout, is a composition. Because if I kill payment API, this class dies because it doesn't have any, any client. This is a fair thing to say. But logically, if I understand the kind of responsibilities of each class has, and the, the forces that they will have to evolve, they are different. And in this case, although it has a single client, I would still treat that as an aggregation and not a composition. So I would be very uh, comfortable to unit test this class mocking this class. What is important in here is to understand that these exercises, we are now using mocks. Because this client, the, cl the needs of this class is to say, look, I will deal with the, the, the JSON stuff, but I want a class that can help me. Hey, helper. Make this payment for me and give me a result. And then I will do the transformation to, to the client. So this need, I can use a mock to define what this thing is and what this interface will be. So for me, mocking is, is a design tool. And then I can go back to what I had in here. Checkout payment, uh, so that the checkout logic involves sub-steps in the flow. Payment, create order, deliver notification. So for example, we can have like, so, Checkout, what is the relationship between checkout and payment? The payment logic, uh, the order logic, the delivery logic, and the notification logic. 
I now need to understand, because now I'm done, so I was able to unit test this one, mock this one, and I can test my entire navigation. If I do that for all my APIs and stuff, I can test all the navigation just mocking the back end. Now I need to continue. So, OK, but this was not done yet. So what is the role of this class? So if I call the make a payment first, and then as I'm mocking this, I'll need to define which parameter I'm going to have and what's going to come back. So this is where the mock is a design tool. It allows us to say that the behavior is going to be here. That's how I access the behavior. That's the, what I need to pass, and that's what I will need to return. So you can use mock to design that interface. And then you are done with this. Then you can move inwards. So you are coming from outside and moving inwards. Now I go to this class in here. So I will, this class now has a make a payment. And this class was designed to satisfy the client class. Right? So the reason that this class exists with this is to satisfy a client. So now I need to ask, if I call this method, what should happen? Oh, we need to process the payment, and there is a lot of complication here. We need to create the order. There's complication. There's delivery. There's notification. OK, so that's way too much in here. How much behavior do I want to keep in the checkout action, and how much behavior do I want to delegate? That's, uh, again, another design decision. And then I need to understand, in order to make these because I'm test driving, right? So I wrote a test for this class, and now I'm writing tests for this class at a unit level. So I need to decide the, the boundaries, the unit. So the unit under test for this one doesn't include this one. Now I need to say, what is the size of this unit? So would payment have different forces to change compared to the checkout? When you do some analysis, you say, well, there are different business people, different areas that say, hey, we would like to support PayPal or another credit card. Or in certain countries, you are not allowed to use certain payment methods. So there is a lot of business decisions that happen behind the scenes by different actors that impact the evolution of this area of the system. And that is completely unrelated to the flow. The flow would be the same. You do the payment, you create an order, you do the delivery, you do the notification. But the details of what happens in here is not only evolution of the code, it's evolution of the business as well. Right? There are business decisions and agreements and contracts signed in order to provide certain payment methods in certain countries. So when you analyze the domain and the business, it's very safe to, to make a, a decision that this is an aggregation, because these will evolve or has a chance to evolve completely independent from the rest. Order is the same. Order management is not only important when you, when you try to buy something. There is a, a department in the back office of the, the organization that is dealing with these orders. Customers will call in and say, where the hell is my package? I paid and I haven't received. Or it was broken, or I, it was not what I wanted. So there is a whole set of uh, a, a group of people and systems that will need this. So it's, pos so it's also quite safe to assume that the logic related to order should not be part of the checkout, should be used by the checkout, but should not be under the same unit. Because the forces to evolve, those two, I don't, if they evolve, as long as the interface remains the same, I don't want this to be broken. And then delivery is the same thing. Delivery is a very complicated thing if you, when you have like, these international companies delivering in different countries. They have deals with local people, local uh, companies, to do the actual delivery. So this also has a lot of business people behind and evolving this. Certain delivery methods are not available in certain countries or not. The notification, I decided, oh, you know, once this is done and I get the res response, in this case, I probably will make the notification, because the notification now is just to send an email out and stuff. I might have some uh, classes to do that separate from this, but it's part of the thing. If I inline this one into here, this would still be reasonably cohesive. I'm just making it up. That's just to give an, ex an example. Those are design decisions. And you need to make those design decisions before you write the test. Because otherwise, how do you test it? If you are trying to, you can make afterwards, but that means that you're, you need to start putting all this logic inside ch checkout in the green, so going to red to green very fast, and populating the checkout module with a lot of logic related to this, to this, to this, to wait for the, one of the refactoring cycles to start extracting them and then move the tests across and then decide where they're going to put the boundaries. It's very wasteful to do this way. I think that you can do a very quick analysis 
and make this decision up front. So once we understand that, when you do this design analysis, how much time do I have? Shit. <laughs> I, could go, I could stay here forever, as always. Let me just put this back. So these design decisions in here it made just worse, right? So uh, now it's very safe for us to start, for example, well, let's put a payments class in here that could be mocked. And then I say, like, in order to test drive the checkout action, I already understand in my domain. I made a decision that there will be some logic in here, so this is my design decision. In my test, I said I'm going to call this class, but I'm going to delegate part of the responsibility to this class. So how would this flow work? How do I access that behavior? So then I can say, well, it could be, I don't know, uh, pay. Could we have a method called pay, and I need to decide what parameters it would have, what the return type. So mocking now, you allow me to go to the details. What do I pass? What do I return? Uh, and stuff like that. I can also have an orders, which I also need to decide, uh, like create or something like that, what's going to go in, what's going to go out. Again, I can use a mock in there to refine the details. The delivery as well. Right, so ship or whatever, ship to client, ship to client. And then there is the notification side. The notification I decided to keep inside checkout. So I can have a process in here that would be send notification. So this could be a private method in here, could be another class hanging off this one, but it's part of the same unit. So in my test, I could mock those three but I don't need to potentially mock these. Unless it is going to an email sender, then I mock at that level, that boundaries. But what is interesting in here is that now I know that I will need to finish the contract in here, what comes back, right? So what is the, the result of these, these things? So there will be some sort of a result in here or whatever there will be. I need to define that in my mocks, and then I will populate and then return. But this allows me what, this is what we call outside in TDD. That's the difference between the class assist. We start from the outside of our system, and we say, like, what is the first class that's going to handle the external world, or the, the request from the external world? This one. What this class should do. And then you list a bunch of stuff. And if you, are a, if you list more than one, we need to decide how, mu how many of those things I want to keep inside, and how many of these things I want to delegate. And then you apply composition aggregation to decide that. And then a few things will emerge. So this class is injecting to this one, this one into this one, this one into this one, this one into this one. So now we have this injecting into here, three classes injecting into here. This gives us a hint of, ooh, do I have one class talking to too many? Because if we, if we have one class talking to 10 classes, it will be mock hell. We cannot, mock, we cannot blame mocks for the design decisions that we are making. But this is allowing us to explore. If I see that one class is talking to too many classes, of course it will be complicated to test that. But I have what we call in coupling, it's called fun out. It's one class that talks to too many. Imagine the Russian dolls that normally they go through uh, big ones until the small ones gracefully, right? So they are big level of abstraction or high level of abstraction until low level of abstraction. This is the same. If you start adding more mocks to this one, or more collaborations, you have a big Russian doll full of small Russian dolls inside. And then what you, what you need to do is to say, hey, maybe some of these collaborations here, some of these calls, I could group them into another class. And then instead of having one class talking to 10, I could have one class talking to three, and then each one of those threes would talk to another, would talk to another two or three. And then you start distributing the, the, the degree of abstraction of your system gracefully. And, it, and then mocks would not be a problem. In, in outside in TDD, this is the execution flow, right? Execution flow. It's completely focused on behavior, the other one is focused on state. 
This, the design direction is alongside the, the execution flow. The test direction is uh, uh, aligned as well. So I normally prefer this kind of approach when I'm building flows. But, but this approach would not work for the discount calculator. Imagine that one of those things in here, somewhere, another class in here, there was a discount calculator. And there was a, a method uh, calling calculate discount, that's your uh, data. For that class in specific, I'll say, shit, how do I evolve this? I know that this data comes in, this data, and this number comes out. I would flip to class assist. I would work in very small increments, write a test, write a bit of code just to make it en uh, enough to pass, look at it and see if I find some duplication, if I find some patterns, if I find some different levels of abstraction, and I keep doing, and then I, at some point something will emerge. So it's the degree of confidence. So if something I cannot see, if I cannot see the solution or the abstractions, when I, when I, vi when I think about the inputs and outputs, I go classicist. And I let the design emerge as I, get, as I gain more insights. But if I can clearly, clearly understand this, I won't do that the other way, because it will be very wasteful. I will go straight for the abstraction that I want. So I could stay here forever. So let me just go to one of the, how much time do I have? Zero. <laughs> Two hours, you said? <laughs> ah. There, are, uh, there is a thing that uh, I want to go very quickly. I call it uh, inflection point. Inflection point, imagine that this is the most straightforward solution you can have. Straightforward. And this is the future proof. So normally, when we design software, we can go all the way what the future will look like. And then we try to do this big design up front. The opposite of it is the under engineering is like, just let's do the simplest thing could possibly work. Both are bad in my view. And I think that what is important here is, um, let me just, uh, we need to, when we are designing, why don't we use just strings and ints? Why do we want to create a type? Why don't you do it in a procedural way? Why do we create a class or a method? Why do we create components? Why do we, do we use hexagonal architecture? Why do we divide our system in different modules? Why do we want to go microservices? There's, those are all design decisions just at different levels. So, but why do we make them? If I'm discussing with one of you, I might say, look, I want to start small and grow. And you might say, no, I want to start a little bit bigger. So why do we, so given the same requirement, why would we design this differently at different levels? Because we are trying to optimize for something. So why we are not doing the most straightforward solution, not because we like to complicate things, it's because in our head there is something, either through our experience, or because of our knowledge of what is coming, or what you're gonna be having problem with very soon, that we will start moving this slide to look, you know what, I want to optimize a little bit more. I know that we could do a little bit simpler, but maybe we could create this interface in here. Instead of having this JDBC code or this database code inside of, inside of our page, let's create a few layers. Well, that would be simpler. Well, depending on how you, you define simple. But if we want to push that down, the, 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 the database code from the page to a repository going through a delivery mechanism and your hexagonal and stuff, why are you doing that if you don't need? is because in your head you are optimizing that for changeability or to separation of concerns. So those are optimizations, and you need to understand how far do you go. So how do we find this, this point when we are designing? One of the things is understand why, what you are optimizing for. And then we can come from different directions. So I can go from left to right and say, look, 
how far can I go knowing that we need to have a, 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 an SLA, an expert uh, transactions per second, or we need to support a new credit, our, our, we are building a credit card feature now, Visa, and our next feature is Amex. So why would I do something very specific for Visa, knowing that I will do Amex straight uh, away after that? Why would I refactor everything? So, so we can go from the simplest solution. So how can I make it a little bit more future-proof or prepare for the optimization that I want to do, but without investing too much right now? Because if you pass that point, then you're doing far too much. The investment is too big for the degree of uncertainty that you have. Because you need to make sure that it's a guess that you're going to do certain things. So you need to decide how much you're going to invest according to the certainty that you have of what's coming next. Or you can come the other way around. You can come from right to left. You can say, look, there are certain things that you need to have in order to go to production or in order to reach this milestone. So, but, I'm building, but this milestone, or the, the release date, has all these features that we need to build. So how can we keep our solution simple as we go through each feature without compromising what we need to achieve? So we can go the other way around. So once you start rationalizing that, so the discussions between you and your peers is not about the solution anymore. You can map that now. Why does one person want a design and the other one wants another design, and how complex are going to make right now? So you can use that to find this inflection point that can be here, can be here, can be anywhere. So, I, of course, I'm way over time. There's a ton of stuff that I won't cover. Um, so what's the message here? The message is like, test-driven development is a phenomenal tool. It's a thing that I started doing almost 14 years ago, and I never, never looked back. I absolutely adore the rhythm, that discipline. Specify what you want, make it work, make it better. The design aspect of it, I cherry pick. Sometimes I design a little bit more up front, sometimes I let it emerge according to the degree of confidence that I have in the solution that I'm building. So I believe, strongly believe that if you learn how to design well, TDD will be much easier. If you understand that there are different styles and you have a good foundation of design, TDD will be easy. Thank you very much. <laughs>